Good morning. I am Dennis Schmidt, the pastor of Dubuque Community Church. And the title of today's message is Life Under Pressure. A definition of pressure would probably be of great value at this point. It's the use of persuasion or influence or intimidation to make someone do something that they would not normally choose to do. Today's slide is an artist rendition of Paul and Silas from, from Acts chapter 16 singing in prison after having been beaten by the people of the whole town. Apparently they had some sort of inner strength that we might not have but may be needing more of in the near distant future. I hope I am wrong but I see many dark clouds on the horizon. I see a time when, not too far in the future when all true followers of Christians in America, this, in America, are going to experience greater pressure to accept the standards of this world and by default to stop being true to the following of Jesus Christ and abandon the Bible and its principles. In the not just too distant past, American, we Americans had great opportunity to express our Christian faith in public and at the workplace. Back then, supervisors sought out true Christian employees because they, of their character. They did not have to worry if they were going to steal or whether they're going to come in tomorrow morning, they were always clear-minded and ready to work. Those days may be past. Recently, I was reading an article by Chris, Chris Stoll, Stoll Walker, from, an article from the Business Insider. It's a business magazine telling why we need to shut down conservative websites. He said that he had studied 120 million posts and found that members' profiles were peppered with such words that caused him concern, such as conservative, God, love, Christian, patriot, and proud American. These terms were concerning him and he was using these examples to show why those people should not have a voice in our public square of information. Well, that's very concerning to me to hear things of that sort. So we're going to look at a warning today that Jesus gave to his disciples shortly before he would face his time of great pressure in a very short time, he would be falsely arrested and crucified on a cruel Roman cross. He said this, The time is coming and has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me all alone, and yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. So he saw dark clouds coming on the horizon as well. He said, I see him coming, and now he said, it's here. And maybe it's getting closer to being here, here in America as well. Our time may have arrived as well. He says, has come when you will be scattered. You know, when a wolf comes and finds a flock of sheep, he scatters them all out. That's the first thing he does. And then he looks for the weakest one to kill it. And uh, that, that's what, wh how he works. And it says, send each one to his own home. And the devil kind of, well, he does work that way as well. It says, you will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. Jesus was entering a time of great pressure, and he was going to make it through. We know from, from the Bible that he did, 
because he remembered one simple truth that his father was with him. He was not going through it alone. We need to remember that same information in our lives so that no matter what, how much pressure we have to endure, we need to recognize also that the Father is with us. And I believe that is the key to getting through any pressure. Well, then he said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. He is, Jesus is saying so that in me, not on our own strength, our own power, but in the abiding love of Jesus Christ, staying close to the shepherd, keeping our eyes on Jesus and his kingdom, and when we do, we will have peace and inward quietness and rest, tranquility on the inside, not dependent on outward circumstances. I believe that is a great key there. He said, but you will have trouble. And in Greek, that word for that is thipsis, which means pressure. That's that word pressure. And the title of our message today, of course, was Life Under Pressure. It means to be inflict, afflicted or to be persecuted or troubled. And uh, it's some kind of harassment that will exert pressure on you to do something that you would not normally choose to do. But he says this, when you're going through this, take heart. Be of good courage. Don't be discouraged when you face these kind of difficulties. And here's why, he said, because I have already overcome the world. Jesus prevailed and won the victory over this fallen world. This fallen world did everything they could to destroy Jesus. But when he rose from the tomb victorious on the third day, he rose triumphantly over all that the world could throw at him. Hallelujah. So it says, so I say, was Jesus just presenting a worst case? You know, sometimes people, they say, well, this is the worst case. Was he saying this might just happen to a few select people? But most people would never have to face anything like this. No, that's not true at all. A matter of fact, right now all over the world, many of our Christian brothers and sisters are facing, experiencing severe persecution and pressure for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For people who are already living in socialistic, atheistically ruled countries or predominantly Muslim or even some Hindu countries, this has been the rule for some time already. Every indicator shows that religious persecution, especially for Christians, is rapidly increasing all over the world. So let's look at the book of Acts where the Apostle Paul and his missionary companion Silas were about to experience their time of pressure to see if we can learn something, to see how they could sing in the midst of their storm just the way Jesus said that they would and we could also if we stayed close to him. So in Acts 16 there, 16 and 17, it says, Once when they were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Well, as always, the Bible fills in some of the details, and as you read it, you can just be almost like you feel like you're walking with Paul and Silas in this actual event. And here's an important part. 
Paul and Silas are going to pray. They're going to a place of prayer. They were not at this point aware at all of the trial that was about to come upon them. But I, I really believe that when we have a regular place and a time of prayer, it's going to assist us in facing our unexpected times of pressure or times of trial. Well, they're walking along and they're just walking. And here's a girl that said she had a spirit. Well, unfortunately, this was not the Holy Spirit. There's Holy Spirits and the Holy Spirit, and there's many polluted spirits, unclean spirits, and she had one of those demonic, unclean spirits. Her ability was empowered by the devil. So it said she had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She was a fortune teller. This is a demonic activity that is getting more and more accepted in our increasingly secular culture. However, participation in fortune telling is expressly forbidden by the word of God. And it said she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Fearful people who are not trusting in the goodness of God will pay a lot of money to have someone supposedly tell them about their uh, future. So she's doing all this for, for, with fortune telling. Then it said the girl followed Paul and the rest of the, us shouting. They didn't say speaking. Shouting. She's shouting out loud. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Well, in all the devil's lies, and I told you she was under demonic influence, there is always a certain amount of truth. The most powerful lie is the one that has just enough truth in it to make you believe it, but not enough truth in it to direct you to the real truth uh, that what you need in, is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So she says they're servants of the Most High God. They're, that was true. Then they, she said they're telling you the way to be saved. And that also is true. But most likely, we can, you know, I believe she was saying it in a mocking way. And I've seen people doing this. They do it to demean and distract from what these godly disciples were trying to do for the good of the people. So it says she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became, became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. Well, the apostle Paul had said he was so troubled. He was so grieved by the lost condition of this young girl who was enslaved both by her masters and by the devil, said to the spirit, and this is really interesting, Paul did not talk to the girl. He commanded the unclean spirit to leave her. And how did he do it? He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, not by Paul's authority, Oh, but by the authority of the one and only Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it said, at, at that very moment, the spirit left her. Instantaneously, this spirit had to leave. This makes it very clear to me that Jesus is the one in control over the demonic forces. Well, you'd think everybody's going to really be happy for this poor young girl that she's been set free from her demonic slavery. But as always, it never, there's not everybody that's always happy. And in the next slide, it said, when the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, when the spirit was gone, their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. 
Well, it said when the, their opportunity for making money was gone, I, I had a, a person one time who was very wise in the, thing of the things of the world, and he told me, if you ever want to see the worst side of people, get between them and their money. So it said they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. You know, they didn't say citizens arrest or they didn't say come with us, we want to take you to the civil authorities. They violently and abusively hauled them to the center of the town. And then they brought them to the, before the magistrates, which is what they should have done. But then they began to bring false accusation. It said, these men are Jews and they are throwing our city into an uproar. Well, it was pretty quiet until they started all this. And, uh, you know, this is the charge that is often thrown at Christians around the world. They just don't fit in with the rest of us. Uh, they, don't just, they don't do all the same things we do. It said, and it's throwing our city into an uproar. And then in verse 21, it says, how are they doing it? By advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. Advocating customs, encouraging different lifestyles. If you're going to be a follower of Christ, there's things that other people will do and you will not do. And there's things you will do that nobody else is doing. Choosing to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they say unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. They're saying these illegal acts and they had done nothing illegal well the next verse tells us the crowd there's a huge crowd there by this point they joined in on the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and to be beaten what is so ironic is that the crowd and the magistrates are now doing exactly what they were accusing Paul and Silas of doing although they weren't the Roman law clearly stated that prisoners must be tried before they could be punished, and then the soldiers must, which should, should dole out the, the uh, punishment. This was just mob violence, and it broke everyone of, Ro of the Roman rules. So it said they were stripped and beaten. And that when they would strip people, that was another way uh, of humiliating them. And also it would cause the whips, the, the, the whipping, to do even more damage. So it says in verse 23, after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Well, any flogging is severe. But it said they were severely flogged. So they really uh, took a lot of abuse. And I, the people, their anger was there. And I really believe they were all thinking, we're going to put some pressure on these guys and make example out of these two troublemakers so we don't have anybody else coming around here to bother us. And then in verse 24, it, it's not on this, well, it is on this, there, verse uh, Guard, he said, guard them carefully. But the very next verse says, upon receiving such orders, this is the captain of the guard, he put them in the upper inner cells and fastened their feet in the stocks. Well, I guess everybody thought we won't be hearing from them two jaybirds anymore. Uh, they should have sure learned their lesson. But in the next slide, which is the one we started out with, uh, these scripture verses, not on the screen, but here we are back to that original screen. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, and that's a key, they start out praying, and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. It's important for us to realize that all around us are unsaved people who are watching us they are evaluating us to see how we respond to pressure, 
to decide if we have something that they don't have but really want. Well, then the next verse, not on the screen, says this. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake. You know, I love that word suddenly in the Bible because it's often when God shows up when it looks like everything is going against God's people. And suddenly, just when it looks like everything is lost, God shows up, and when he appears, everything changes. So it said suddenly, in verse 26, not on the screen, there was such a violent earthquake. Again, I guess all earthquakes are somewhat violent, but this was a violent earthquake. It was so violent, violent that the foundation of the prisons were shaken. So prisons were usually built in the most solid of, of part of any place, usually right on solid rock. And at once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. What a picture of the freedom that God can bring to people who are locked up and enslaved. Well, the next picture shows us this, uh, another artist's rendition of that. When the jailer woke up, when he said, there's an earthquake, you're going to wake up. And when he saw all the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. You know, normally prisoners, they're going to escape if they get a chance but not these two. We're going to see, not them. They, didn't, they were not feeling guilty. They had no reason to run. Verse 28. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourselves. We are all here. This was true Christian love displayed by Paul and Silas. Silas, after they had endured all these beatings... And had all the pain that they had been inflicted on them, Paul still had enough concern for the welfare of the jailer that he cries out, don't harm yourself. He was trying to do what was best for the jailer. And that's what true love is. It's not a feeling. It's doing what's best for the other people around him. Well, in verse 29, out on the screen, it said, The jailer called for lights, lights, because this is the middle of the night. It's probably 2, 3 in the morning. And he rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then it said that he then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, sirs was a title of great respect. He had just thrown him in his inner prison, and now he's calling them sir. And he's asking a question that every Christian would want to be asked, anyone who, who really loves the Lord, what must I do to be saved? What must I do so that I can obtain the peace of heart under such, impre uh, such intense pressure that you guys could sit I believe he heard them singing in the midst of their trials and he thought these people have something I don't have but I want and then in 31 Paul tells them they they replied believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved you and your whole household he didn't say believe in us he didn't say join the church. He didn't say give money. He didn't say be nice to other people. He just simply said put your faith, your total faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, as the Savior of the world which he came to be. Put your faith in him. Well, in verse 32 through 34, not on the screen, it says, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. And verse 33 says, at that hour of the night, again, 2, 3 in the morning, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. You know, repentance means a change of mind, which also makes a difference in your actions. It wasn't that long ago he was helping inflicting the pain, and now he's there 
washing out their wounds, which tells me something. The whip marks were so deep, he was trying to wash the, the poison out of them and the infection out of them. And then, really, really to show great repentance, a great change of heart, it says that immediately he and his family were baptized. Well, this took, this took great, <laughs> great humility on his part. What were the rest of the townspeople were going to think? When they found out that the guy, that they, the people that he said were supposed to be watching the jail, now he's out there hanging out with them, helping them, and being baptized by them. Baptism always takes a large amount of humility, but this shows me the humility of this, this man and the trust that he had in God. Well, verse 34 even goes on, even after the baptism, the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. Boy, talk about a change of heart. And then it says, he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, him and his whole family. Well, remember the title of today's message, Life Under Pressure? Do you see the good that comes when you are ready to, to, to look to Jesus Christ to give you that, that, uh, that for, uh, strength in the middle of your pressure? All over the world, where there is no persecution of the Christian church, it often becomes, after a while, becomes weak and dormant with almost no growth. However, wherever in the world that the church is under the pressure of persecution, the number of people coming into the body of Christ, the church, the number of people choosing to follow Jesus as their Savior, explodes. Tertullian, a very early church father, said Christians have always believed that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Well, how about you? Do you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? As pressure comes in your lives, do you go to him and, and other people around you can look at you and say, this is somebody who can be graceful under pressure? You can only do that. You can only have this supernatural peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. I challenge you today, if you've never opened up your life to the Lord Jesus, that today you would ask him, to come in and be your Lord and Savior and forgive you your sins and give you the free gift of eternal life and give you that strength that he gave to Paul and Silas. God bless you and may the Lord bless you. Amen.